Recently, in the British journal The Guardian, an article was published under the title, Do We Need a New Theory of Evolution? The article paints a grim picture of the field of evolutionary biology. We learn of great chaos. A battle with, quote, the weight of a theological schism. We're told there is a revolution led by a neglected group of underdogs. They fight passionately against the tormenting genetic theory of evolution by natural selection. The article describes those who oppress these brave rebels as, quote, high priests. High priests who dominate and ostracize all those who dare question the, quote, evolutionary orthodoxy. It's treason, then. As you can see, the Guardian's picture of what's happening in the field of evolutionary science is pretty exciting. The question is, is anything they said actually true? That, my friends, is the question that we will be diving into today, right here, right now. Normally, I ignore stuff like this. Newspapers all around the world are failing. They have to be more and more sensational. They need to make things that will rub people the wrong way so that they get shared and talked about. I mean, look at this. I just made an advertisement for their, their uh, article. You know, I took the bait. I took their clickbait. Well, the reason that I'm responding to this article in particular is because I received a letter from a school teacher, a high school teacher. She was teaching math, and she just got switched to having to teach biology. She had to take that on as well. She is not trained in biology. She found that article and she panicked. Just to keep her identity private, I'm going to call her Miss Johnson. I'm going to show you part of the letter. I recently found an article in The Guardian claiming that scientists don't actually understand evolution and they are desperately grasping for a new theory. Is this true? Is the concept of evolution as described in our textbooks wrong? For those of you who are new to this channel, you don't know who I am. You might be wondering why is it that teachers are writing me letters. My name is John Perry. I am a science curriculum developer. I work directly with researchers in the fields of chemistry, genetics, and biology to develop science lessons that high school and middle school teachers can use in their classrooms. Those lessons are delivered mainly in the form of animations on the website statedclearly.com. In short, my job is to support science teachers. So, Miss Johnson, is the concept of evolution as described in our textbooks wrong? No, Miss Johnson, your textbook is fine. Assuming that you're using, you know, one of the books common in the American public school system, evolution is taught accurately in these books, and the version of evolution presented in them is not being abandoned by scientists, as the Guardian article seems to suggest. That said, I don't expect you to simply take my word for it. Instead, let's take a look at the Guardian article and compare it to, well, reality. The article starts by complaining that the typical explanation for the evolution of mammal eyes, the explanation found in textbooks, starts, quote, midway through the story, taking for granted the existence of light-sensitive cells, lenses, and irises without explaining where they came from in the first place. End quote. Now, this complaint is technically true, but maliciously misleading. Yes, most textbooks do start somewhere in the middle of the story when it comes to eyeball evolution, and yes, they give very few technical details about the origin of lenses and so on, but there's an obvious reason for this. It is an introductory textbook designed to give students an overview of what scientists have discovered. As is true with any introductory textbook on any topic, if you want all the details, you have to look in the primary scientific literature, or in the case of eye evolution, there happens to be a specialist book on the topic, which I do recommend to anyone who's huh, curious enough to pay $75. Dang. Well, I suggest asking your local library to buy it for you. 
If your students are most interested in how the first light-sensitive cells evolved, it's a little bit of a different topic, there's a general overview in the scientific literature right here, and it's totally free. Light and the Evolution of Vision. Aside from that, I recently read this gem of a paper, diving specifically into what we currently know about the origin of photoreceptive proteins, the evolutionary relationship between microbial rhodopsins and metazoan rhodopsins. The article then claims that we have no idea how wings evolved. Okay, we do understand how wings evolved. Wings, if you're talking about bird wings, they are modified arms. Right now, thanks to work in developmental biology, we now have a really clear idea how feathers evolved. It's a really interesting story. I get made fun of sometimes because, I don't know if you can see, people like to point out that I have an entire book just about feathers behind me on my shelf. What a nerd I am. Well, guess what, losers? I don't have one book about feathers. I've got multiple volumes. I love these old books where they just, they detail every little thing on a chicken. Nobody makes these anymore. You have to buy them on eBay and they're a lot of money. I've done multiple videos on the evolution of flight. I did one with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, What Good is Half a Wing? I did a guest lecture at Oregon State University on the topic, which was recorded and is on this channel. And actually, last year's Christmas special was about the evolution of wings. So that's strike one against the Guardian article for being so misleading there. It continues by talking about a group of researchers who claim that the, quote, modern synthesis is currently holding science back. Now, this thing, the, quote, modern synthesis, it is a loose family of concepts and evolutionary models that were widely popularized, arguably starting in the 1940s. The modern synthesis is not usually mentioned in textbooks, but when reading reports on the history of science, you'll often see the modern synthesis described as a merger between evolution by natural selection with Mendelian genetics. The modern synthesis is what we call a research program. It was a set of popular interests that were guiding researchers as they decided what was worth studying. One of the extremely impressive achievements often associated with the modern synthesis an achievement that was oddly downplayed in the Guardian article, was the mathematical formalization of evolution by natural selection. So Darwin's somewhat messy ideas were translated into precise mathematical equations. You can see some of these equations at work on the wonderful YouTube channel called Primer. I posted a link to my favorite Primer animation down in the video description. Make sure to check that out. This math was so useful that variations of these equations are now found in the work of chemists, sociologists, economists, and have inspired many algorithms currently used in computer science, especially in the subfield of artificial intelligence. So, I don't know, one day if we find ourselves enslaved by our new robot overlords, I suppose that, in part, you can thank Darwin. Today, some scientists worry that the enormous success of the modern synthesis has caused the field of evolutionary biology to cling too hard to the concepts popularized back in the 40s. And honestly, that is a fair concern. No one wants to see us coasting on the fumes of yesteryear's ambition. Several years ago, a group of concerned researchers, armed with nothing but their wits and <laughs> millions and millions of dollars in funding donated to them by the John Templeton Foundation, I don't mean to get all Jerry Coiny on you all, but the funding source of an organization can influence its message. So this really is a fact worth noting, and for some reason, the Guardian article neglected to do so. This concerned group of researchers claim that it is now time for a new era of research, an era they call the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis. They even have their own website and a cool little logo. In my personal interactions with members of this group, most of them seem totally reasonable. There are some exceptions. There are those who pretend to be scientific revolutionists, but, you know, self-proclaimed revolutionists are actually somewhat common even outside the extended synthesis, so I don't want to be too hard on the movement. Most folks in the EES, they humbly understand that their work is merely an extension of the work that was done before. As The Guardian put it, most people in this group simply, quote, want their subfields, plasticity, evolutionary development, 
epigenetics, cultural evolution, not just recognized, but formalized in the canon of biology. So when you Google evolution, they want their work, if not their names, to be at least mentioned on the Wikipedia page. That would be nice, right? I want to end by talking about phenotypic plasticity, because this is a concept that was discussed correctly in some parts of the article, and falsely in other parts. Plasticity is an organism's ability to change its traits in real time, so during its own lifetime, in response to specific environmental conditions. For example, when you lift weights, you grow bigger muscles. When a person goes out in the sun, their skin can tan. Developmental plasticity is when an organism changes how it grows or develops according to environmental conditions. The article talks a lot about plasticity in polypterous fish. This is a group of fish still alive today that have well-developed gills and well-developed lungs. If raised in a tank full of water, their lungs stay small, their fins stay fish-like. If, however, they are removed and raised on land, as they struggle to pull themselves against gravity, fin muscles strengthen, as you might expect, but also bones of the fins change shape and do so in a way that makes them measurably better at floppy fishwalking. The Guardian article claims that this type of plasticity may have helped facilitate the evolutionary transition from water to land, and I agree with them on this. Finally, they wrote something that made sense. Sadly, however, the Guardian goes on to make the following claim. Undergraduates beginning their education are unlikely to hear anything about it. Anything about plasticity. This statement is simply false. In every single college and every single high school biology text I have looked at, comments about plasticity, usually in the form of nature versus nurture, they are peppered all throughout the text and there's usually an entire section specifically dedicated to the topic of plasticity. Now, in The Guardian's defense, plasticity often goes by a different name in textbooks. A species' degree of plasticity is usually referred to as its norm of reaction, and a trait that is highly plastic is called a multifactorial trait. This means that many factors, genetic and environmental, collectively influence the trait. This right here is Dr. Emily Standen. She's the woman who discovered the extreme plasticity in those walking fish. The Guardian article made it seem like she's a member of the extended evolutionary synthesis. Her work, which was by far the most impressive work in that article, was cited as if it were theirs. Well, it is not theirs. When Dr. Standen had a new idea, instead of complaining about the evolutionary orthodoxy, she set up an experiment she carefully documented and then published the results. She was not persecuted for those results. She was not ostracized. The, quote, high priests of the, quote, evolutionary orthodoxy did not have her silenced. To the contrary, her research was funded by the National Science Foundation and other mainstream grants, the same ones controlled by the orthodoxy. Her results were so thorough, they were published in and celebrated by the prestigious journal Nature. Today, whenever possible, she does public outreach events. She cares so much about her work that she didn't even let the pandemic slow her down. When speaking venues were closed, she posted presentations on YouTube. So to answer the Guardian's question, do we need a new theory of evolution? No. But it would be nice if all of us would try to be a bit more like Emily. If you like this video, please share it. Post a link on Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. Email it to people who you think should see this.